reelected in 2022. Secretary Reichenberger is a lifelong conservative Republican. He moved to Georgia 40 years ago to raise a family and start a small business. As a licensed professional engineer and structural engineer, licensed in 40 states and licensed general contractor in Georgia and other states, Raffensperger <coughs> successfully founded Tendon Systems, a provider of high strength steel for construction products. Under Secretary Raffensperger's ownership, Tendon Systems grew to become the Southeast's largest post tensioning specialist contractor with approximately 150 employees and projects in over 40 states. Brad has also founded Trillium Structures, a structural design concerning firm with commercial mid-rise and high-rise projects throughout the Southeast. Secretary Raffenberger was elected to the City Council in Johns Creek, Georgia. Three years later, he was elected to the Georgia House of Representatives where he served two terms, and in 2018, Georgia voters elected him Secretary of State. <laughs> the Secretary's top priority is secure and acceptable elections. As Secretary of State, Brad delivered the largest implementation of voting machines in the history of this country on time and on budget. Under Secretary Raffensperger's leadership, Georgia modernized its election system by adding its first audible paper ballot system and giving the power to secure Georgia's election directly to the voter. He is the first Secretary of State to pass legislation requiring photo ID for all forms of voting and first to hold counties accountable to voters by expanding polling places. Brad and his wife Patricia started out as high school sweethearts and have now been married for over 45 years. They raised three sons and immensely enjoy spoiling their three grandchildren. <laughs> there are members of the North Point Community Service. Please welcome Secretary of State Raffenberger. Well, good morning. It's a good afternoon, I guess. It's uh, a pleasure coming before Rotary to be able to speak to you today. Uh, we do need to shorten that introduction. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am an engineer, and engineers really don't talk so much about themselves and really don't enjoy when other people are talking about them, you know, that kind of boastful stuff. If we get the dog cuss, we can handle that. Uh, we're used to that sometimes. But uh, I just want to let you know it's, it's great to always speak before Rotary groups. In fact, I just thought this is great. I get to speak before a Rotary today. And I think they're doing something up in Washington, D.C. Because just think, if every morning you woke up in Washington, D.C., before they got started, they, they read the four-way test. Like, I know you're going to read this later, but just think about it. They start off with, is it the truth? Wow. No, I mean, think about it. Is it fair to all concern? Double wow. And when you're trying to balance a budget, and you're trying to do a budget, period, you know, in 40 days, I served in the uh, General Assembly, and Senator Gooch and uh, my uh, partner here from the Secretary of State's office, Sam Teasley. Sam and I served together in the House, the lower chamber, and then the Senator Gooch from the higher chamber. But we balanced the budget in less than 40 days, and we had a 40-day session. So you think about the hard work they have to do. I think they need more Rotarians up there. That would be the solution. Yeah, sure. So if they do that, things will start working out really great. I'm going to give you a brief overview, first of all, what our office does. Many people understand that we have something to do with elections. Yes, we do. But we also handle corporations, professional licensing, securities, and charities. I don't know where to begin, so uh, first of all, I'm going to maybe talk a little about corporations. I just want to let you know, we're excited that we now have 1.4 million corporations in the state of Georgia. And when you think about that, that means that you have found people that someday are going to build their business, and someday need a bank loan. Do we have any community bankers here? Any bankers here at all? God bless you, God bless you, because without a, a business loan, Eventually, we run out of juice, and we need to make a loan so we can grow our business. So it's really important. But also, I just want to hope that anyone, anyone form a new corporation this past year, anyone in this room here. Another you know, great American, God bless you. And uh, I just want to give you some advice on how to become a billionaire. What you do is you have a partner, and you build it, and they start in a garage, and they end up with Apple. You know, think about <laughs> how people, they have big dreams, but they always start small. And you just never know where it's going to take, take you. 
we now have 1.4 million businesses in Georgia that are incorporated. And so our job is to make sure that you can get your corporation, uh, get the paperwork going as quickly as possible. So we are updating the back office software. Because if you come and start renewing your corporation in February, you say, it's a little slow today. Yes, because the numbers of corporations we have are so large, and that software hadn't been updated for 20 years. So we're in the process of being, uh, getting that updated so we can get quick responses all the time. I want to let you also know that through a bill that I introduced when I was in the State House, implemented as Secretary of State, thank you, Sarah Gooch, for the unanimous vote we got in the Senate side too. You now can renew your corporation for up to three years, one, two, or three years. And I do want to always make sure I give a shout out to the General Assembly in Georgia. That even though we have two parties in Georgia, what I find is that good stuff that's bipartisan, that's good for all Georgians, seems to move through very quickly. And that kind of leads me to the next one, securities and charities. We had a really, really great bill that was introduced. We asked from our securities division if the state senate would well, go ahead and carry this bill for us. And Senator Chuck Hustetler, a doctor from up in Rome, Georgia, carried this bill. And it was to prevent and try and impede, stop, financial exploitation of our seniors. And what we really noticed, we, it was always an issue, but during COVID it ramped up to a whole different level. And what we really found was very distressing. A lot of times it was close family members. But the challenge that the securities industry has, the financial planners, is that they can't stop transactions if someone else's name is on the account with their great aunt, because this is what the law is. Well, now what you can do is get a five-day pause. Say, call that person up. Ma'am, sir, did you really mean to move $50,000 from here over to here? Do you mean to move $250,000? What are you talking about? Now we, that there's a five-day pause. We can put a stop on those transactions. That's protecting seniors. And Senator Gooch and his Senate <coughs> colleagues carried that through the Senate unanimously, through the House unanimously, and the Governor Kemp signed it into law. And we're making sure we can protect our seniors. And I know that has 100% support of everyone here. And so that's really grateful for that. The other thing is, I, I saw us, we had some financial planners here. I said I was going to put them to work. I want to tell you about some of the programs that we have. Number one, we have now a financial you know, training, a financial literacy program for high schoolers. Do we have any school board members that would like to bring that into the other side? Who we do? So, so it's available. It's free of charge. It's plug and play. But what you might find out is, well, some of our teachers, they don't feel like they're comfortable doing that. I know that some of the counties are already reaching out to the financial industry, the financial services industry. Would you come and teach this course to high schoolers? Because we think before someone leaves high school, they should know two things, civics and something about finances. Before you get that to your credit card, before you get that first loan, before you get the first student loan, find out you know, some good, uh, I guess, understanding of finances. So that's available to all 159 counties, all the school boards throughout the entire state of Georgia. And we'd like to make that available for you. It's plug and play. Uh, so if I you know, found you all some jobs that you weren't busy enough, now you got something else you can do. But it's a great service to give back to your community. And as Rotarians, that's what you do every time. Uh, the other thing we also have is a financial literacy program. I met with some chamber folks. Uh, I guess actually it was you that mentioned that. Uh, your boss or someone mm -hmm. from your company went down to Gainesville and we had a financial literacy program down there about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And so we are you know, really unleashing that program throughout the entire state. During COVID, it was all online. Now it's back in person. So you know, we've been up in Dalton, we've been in Gainesville, Savannah, and throughout the state. But that's really to expand that whole idea of financial literacy, financial empowerment for young entrepreneurs and sometimes they're not even an entrepreneur yet. Just like I was, you know, you kind of want to start your own business, you want to go out on your own, but you have that hesitation factor. It's really to give people information so that then they feel comfortable about starting their first business. So how do I apply for my first business loan? So those are the other things that we offer for everyone. And so those are the big ones. Uh, obviously, uh, everyone knows I got really excited about a month or so ago when uh, Elon Musk was challenging, you know, um, Zuckerberg to a cage fight because I actually am the chair of the Georgian Boxing Commission. <laughs> because the General Assembly, much as I love our dear senators and our state reps, 
when they don't know where to put stuff, we got that. So uh, I ended up with that. I thought maybe I'd get a ticket, you know, for a ringside seat. But I think they decided that, you know, a guy that's 50 years old that doesn't exercise as much as some guy in his 30s, it may not be a good deal. So you know, you, you know just keep on building electric vehicles, and uh, maybe you'll put a plant, your next plant here in Georgia, because we're becoming the EV capital of the world. And I think that just kind of leads to us elections. And I want to kind of go over that real quickly because sometimes people still have, you know, some questions about, first of all, they have a question about what happened in 2020. Now, I'm going to tell you, the, the brief answer is, in 2020, the reason that President Trump came up short is that 28,000 people skipped the presidential race, and yet they voted down ballot in the other races. And then what we also noticed is that the congressmen got about 33,000 more Republican congressmen got about 33,000 more votes than President Trump. And the state reps and the state senators, we found generally the Republican ones got about 5% higher vote totals than President Trump. In fact, I did some research this morning, thank you, uh, that in White County, we had about 70 people that skipped the presidential race, and yet they voted down ballots. <clears throat> and that's what kind of happened. And then you gotta say, well, what, what, was the, what kind of precipitated that? Well, people get to decide who they wanna vote for. And so some people leave a blank, some people vote for people. And so uh, Senator Gooch did very well. And he's on his way for another successful 2024, I'm sure. No, no, probably no, still tell him that. His hands are big enough. But, but also, then, you know, people started, you know, filing lawsuits, and they said there was 10,315 dead people that voted. We checked that out. And over the last three years, all we could really find were four people. Three of them their spouse passed away, and they voted their absentee ballot for them. And in the other case, the person moved out of their house, but they were over 65, so they're on the, what's called the rollover list. You fill that out early in the election cycle. The absentee ballot shows up, but they moved. Well, Bob moved in. He looked at that and says, hmm, I'll vote for that. <clears throat> then he went out and he voted for himself. He didn't think we were going to find out. We did. And when that came before the state election board, he was treated a lot more harshly than the three grieving spouses. You know, you can, okay, it's wrong, we'll slap you on the wrist. That other one really got the book thrown at him, <clears throat> rightly so. So I just want to let you know that that was what happened there. They said that there were 66,000 underage voters, and there was actually zero. Because what they saw, they saw that the, the birth year, they said that they're 17 years old. No, you can register to vote when you're 17 and a half, but you have to be 18. And we had the birthday, day, month, and year. We verified every one of them, and there was actually zero. And actually, if you're, you got uh, grandkids, teenagers that are your kids, uh, they can register to vote when they're 17 and a half, but they can't vote. It won't count until they turn 18 by election day. Then they said there was 2,400 non-registered voters. No, everyone was registered. They said that there was actually just over 2,000 felons that had voted. Well, in Georgia, we had the records. We went back to border parties and parole. We found that there's just a potential of 74 that were still under felony sentence. And so we looked at all those numbers, and it was never enough to overturn it. And then people said, well, what happened at State Farm Arena? Because I'm in the construction industry, just to say, no, I don't have too many people that are on the other side of the aisle of my industry. It seemed like they all like about three or four things, conservative politics, hunting and fishing, and things like that, and obviously UGA football. And so uh, they just, what can you say? You know, every once in a while you get some straight ones out there, but you know, God bless them. Right? But, uh, but I say all that, and my phone was getting torn up when they were showing this whole thing that came from a state senate meeting where you know, Rudy Giuliani came down, and he basically started narrating something that if you watch the whole run of tape, it didn't happen. And so he said that they were pulling out ballots and counting them twice. But actually what had happened at around 10 o'clock, the folks looked at all the ballots that they had there. And they said, we're not going to get done. And so they said, let's just you know, start packing them away, and we'll come back and get it tomorrow. We found out about it, and our election director called the county. He said, what? They're quitting that early? So he say no more. So he called over there and said, guys, you can't quit that soon. In that 30-minute time frame, if you really look, looked at what happened, let's go back to the morning because it was all under 24-7 surveillance. They bring in the absentee ballot storage boxes, and they open them up, and you can see that they're empty. They close them, zip tie them, and they put them underneath the tables. 
when they thought they were done, they pull them out, open them up, and they put in the unscanned ballots and close them up and put them back underneath the tables. When they got the message, hey guys, you aren't done, then they pulled them back out, put them on the tables, and continue to scan. But what did happen is that both the Republican, Democrat Party, and probably independent you know, observers, that there's people there from other outside organizations that were the observers, they thought they were done and never came back. Now, we had an observer there as part of our consent agreement with Fulton County, and he was gone for about 50 minutes. And then we also had one of our post-certified investigators, they're the guys that carry guns, you know, he came back after about 50 minutes also, and they stayed for the remainder. So the question that really was, did anything happen illegal during that 50 minutes? Our investigators looked at it, we looked at the whole run of tape, we watched everything, they said nothing happened. The GBI looked at it, and they said nothing happened. I was up talking to a Tea Party group, and I said, and the FBI looked at it, and guess what they said? Well, you can't trust the FBI. <laughs> and everyone laughed. And it's a sad state of affairs, really, because that was the most recognized law enforcement agency that we had in America. But people kind of chuckled over that. But what they don't realize, and the reason I, I share all this information so you have the full knowledge, is that President Trump actually had someone look at it. And you're probably not aware of that. But Bobby Christine was the U.S. Attorney of the Southern District down in Savannah. When B.J. Pack resigned, as the U.S. Attorney of the Northern District, President Trump handpicked Bobby Christine to come up from Savannah and look at that. Bobby Christine specifically looked at that because he thought, he quoted the AJC, I thought there had to be something there because there was so much talk about it. And he said there was nothing there. And he gave it a clean bill of health. And finally, after almost three years, the state election board looked at everything. And about two months ago, they said, you know, we can dismiss the charges. So there's two election workers. Yeah, they had their, their reputations be smirched all over the internet. They were finally you know, said that they didn't do anything illegal. And so that's really what happened on that situation. But at the end of the day, what really happened in Georgia is that 28,000 people skipped the presidential race. You have to understand that when I took office, when I ran back in 2018, I said we need a new voting system with verifiable paper ballot. With House Bill 316, we passed through the Senate and the House. We got House Bill 316. What that gave us was several key components. One, that we finally had a paper ballot that we could actually run audits on. Running that up, we had the fastest implementation. We were ready to go for the presidential primary. And then all of a sudden, we had COVID. We had about two, two and a half weeks of the presidential primary. And then time out. What are we going to do now? Because we shut down the state. We had all the... the states of emergency that the governor declared, national emergency, et cetera. But we continued on, we worked through that process. The other thing that we got with House Bill 316 was the ability to join a member state, cross state you know, sharing of voter information so we could keep up with voters if they moved. And that was called the Electronic Registration Information Center. After the 2020 cycle, we rolled into 2021. And we passed SB 202, which I think was a very fine piece of legislation. It did several things. Number one, we finally got voter ID for absentee voting. Because when we ran uh, back, or when I ran back in 2018, uh, we were talking about signature match. And that's how we were identifying voters with absentee voting. People said that was subjective. I said, I agree with you. I said, we need to do something different. We need photo ID. And so what we, we did with the General Assembly is we mirrored SB 202 to be what they do in Minnesota, Kansas, and Nebraska and have been doing it for over 10 years. And that's using your driver's license number as the primary form of identification. Now, whatever identification we allow by state law for in-person early voting, in-person election day voting, that's the same you know, identification you can use for absentee voting. In other words, voters get treated the same. And now in Georgia, no matter how you vote, it's based on the photo ID primarily. So if you want to vote absentee, photo ID. Early, photo ID, and the have election, photo ID. 65% of all voters in 2022 are back to their normal patterns. 65% are voting early. 30% are voting on election day. And 5% are voting absentee. So we're back to our kind of the way we used to always do things. It's all voted by, with photo ID. What we think it has really done for voters is given them two things. I think enhanced security, and with that has come elevated confidence. Now, you don't do some things for confidence, but I think when people are taking all their shots and 
creating misinformation, disinformation. If we can do that without placing crazy burdens on voters, we think that's a good thing. Now, I just do want to show one more thing. I think that the law should be equal, apply for everyone. Did I tell you that Minnesota's had photo ID for over 10 years? Did you know that they've never been sued by the United States Department of Justice? And Georgia's right now pushing back and we're fighting that in court. We will meet them and beat them in court, but I just want to let you know it is what it is. But we think it's really good. The other thing, with the last uh, session we just have, we had put in additional audits. Because when you think about the presidential race, you know, after we had the results that we had and it came up short, we had to audit a race. I selected to use the presidential race. Obviously, why? It's the most important race in America, if not in the world. And it was also incredibly close. And I said, and just, instead of doing a 90% risk limit thing or a 95% risk limit, let's do 100%. You know what that means? Then you have to rescan all those you know, 5 million ballots. And I said, but you guys all, people are saying that the machines aren't accurate. Let's do a hand recount. Many, many people don't realize all five million ballots were hand recounted. And then when the election results were determined and it was certified, that's when the candidate could actually, the candidate that came up short could say, I would like to have a recount. So it was counted again. Did you know in White County that you didn't have a single vote total difference between all three counts? It, was, it lined up exactly. No difference, no difference, no difference. All of them were the same. That also says you have a great election office too. Now, we did have three counties in those recounts that struggled. Floyd County up in Rome, they found about almost 3,000 votes, you know, that went for President Trump's favor. So that, you know, helped lower that delta a little bit. Fulton County, they had issues again, and then also Fayette County. But by and large, there is, you know, a multiple of about 40 or so counties that had zero differences. The other ones were like onesies, twosies, things like that. So we added with SB 202 and the last legislation we had last session, additional audits for the upcoming you know, cycle. We think that's good, that we can audit any race just to give voters confidence in the process. We also uh, are working on, we have very clean, accurate voter rolls. We are recognized by the Heritage Foundation. Now, if you're a liberal, you're thinking, I don't like Heritage, they're on the other side of the aisle, they are conservative, but we have high marks <coughs> because we took most of the shots after 2020 from our conservative side, and I'm a Republican, so it kind of hurt my feelings. And, but Heritage came alongside and said, these guys in Georgia, they're number one for election integrity. And so we have clean voter rolls, recognized as the cleanest voter rolls in the country, photo ID for all forms of voting. And we have 17 days of early voting now. President Biden's home state of Delaware, 10 days. Michigan was bragging. I just was at an event, and the Michigan Secretary of State was talking about they have nine days. Well, we have 17 days. What's really awesome is that two of those days are Saturday. And guess who votes on Saturday? Working people. People that have jobs. It doesn't favor anyone. Sometimes people think Sunday voting favors certain people. Well, Saturday voting favors people with jobs that can't get out Monday to Friday. We think that's a great, great way to have opportunities for people to vote. Uh, and then going back on uh, signature match, people were wondering about that. Did you know that we've been sued on signature match? Do you know what political parties sued us? Both of them. Yeah, both of them sued us. Isn't that crazy? Uh, after 2018, when Stacey Abrams lost by 55,000 votes, she sued us, said this is subjective. After 2020, almost word for word, but different party name, we got sued. <laughs> because of, and then, so we've taken that off the table. So what we're trying to do is take things off the table that create doubt or could create doubt, let you know that your vote is secure. Because election integrity, election security is my top priority. And I'm going to continue to fight for that. 2024, I expect will be hotly contested. If you aren't registered to vote, you know, please register. And if you ever have any election doubts, can I ask you to, maybe if you've never done this before, consider doing this. Would you volunteer to be a poll worker? Because we have poll worker training. But go through the process, see how it works. But also, if you have that little bit, I'm from Missouri, I'm from the show me state, well, go ahead and just kind of dig into it so you can kind of figure out what's going on. But I think you're going to understand the system. You're also going to be here in White County work with a top knock <coughs> election director. You're also going to help us because as time goes on, what we find is that when we start with a little bit of gray here, a few years later we get a little bit more, and eventually we say, hey, 
I don't think I can do be a poll worker anymore it's just because it's a long, long day. It's some of the best work you can do, and we can always use more poll workers. So that's my quick overview of everything we have. But I do want to give a shout out to your chamber. I want to give a shout out to you before you know I take questions. Because I want to let you know that every business starts small. And the power of a small business is that it's usually a community-based business. And when your small business does well, God bless you, but also you are blessing your community. And the better you, your business does, the better your community does. And better the people in the community do. And eventually, if every community in Georgia does the same thing, the state's just going to be so prosperous from north to south, east to west. It's just going to be tremendous. But it all starts here with people <coughs> in the local towns and communities that with their small business. So God bless all of you that are pouring back your heart, your soul, and your efforts into your community because you're making America, you're making your community, you're making your state better. One job at a time, one person at a time. It's really important what you do. And to our school board uh, member, God bless what you do. Um, because I know it's tough being a teacher today. I know it's tough being a law enforcement officer. Because what you're seeing is a lot of the things that society is producing. And you really see these stresses that have, you know, happen to us. And, I, and you're really trying to make sure that we have a peaceful society, well-educated society. And that's our way forward. So God bless both of you and what you do. So if you have time. We have I'm time. Have time. <laughs> I'll take a few questions because I don't know what time this thing stops, but uh, fire away. Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, uh, in the AJC this morning, there's an article on the uh, the machine, the menu machine controversy there. So there's some computer science professor, I think he's up in Michigan, that said there's a vulnerability in the software that could change votes from one candidate to the other. Is there any validity to that uh, comment or that controversy? If so, you know, are we doing anything about it? Uh, well, yes, we, we are always working to strengthen our security, but is there anything to his report? I don't believe so, I'll tell you why. First of all, number one, Professor Haldeman actually worked with Stacey Abrams going back, you know, when she was running. He was part of what started with the curling case. We have inherited from Secretary of State Brian Kemp what's called the curling case. It went curling v. Kemp, and then ver curling versus Crediton because she was Secretary of State for a couple months or a month. Now it's curling versus Raffensburg. The whole part of that was that they wanted to do away with electronic voting. We got rid of electronic voting. Now we have a paper ballot. The judge allowed that to morph over to our new machines. He was actually given access with one of his, uh, per, one of the people in his department, also with a PhD. And these people had these machines for 12 weeks. So two people with PhDs, computer science experts, had that, including they had all the access codes, all the passwords, they had everything. And they said, we found, we think, six vulnerabilities. MITRE Corporation, outside other independent organization, that was hired by Dominion as part of their ongoing lawsuits, said, we looked at your six vulnerabilities. Five of them are not even scalable. They're not real world, they're not scalable. And I said the one could potentially be scalable, but in real world conditions, nothing could really happen. So in other words, they didn't say that, there, they said that there was nothing there there. But that said, with House Bill 316, we have to use an EAC certified equipment. Uh, Dominion has updated their software, but we did not get that software update until March of 17th while we were still in session, March 17th, when it was EAC certified. And immediately what we did then, as soon as we got that software, we then started implementing or looking at that on our side. And what we found out is that that new software update that they had did not talk with our poll pads. So since then, Dominion has been working with no ink so they can have connectivity from the standpoint of being able to talk because we have electronic poll pads now. So, by the way, when you go to vote in 2024, all 159 counties will have the electronic poll pad. And so you'll be checking in. In some, some counties, they were checking in in under a minute. That's how quick it is. So they were working on that. And right now, we're getting those finals worked out. As soon as we get that, then we can send it to ProVMV, our vendor, to do a security check on it to make sure it meets our, uh, you know, our security parameters that we have. But now we're already into the, the race right now we have for the municipal elections. We will be doing about five or six you know, 
uh, municipal elections for this fall to make sure everything works. If we do not believe in statewide implementation, a total implementation of all 25, 30,000 pieces of equipment is prudent coming into a presidential cycle. So we'll finish up the 2024 cycle and then begin implementation after that. So we want to make sure it runs well. And so we're doing security checks throughout the entire state. We've been through about 60 of the counties so far. We'll be through all 159 counties, make sure that none of the software has been hacked, none of the software has been modified, that the machines are secure, accurate recording, everything. And then also looking at you know, the physical security of the building so everyone's ready for 2024. Thank you. Not to air family business out, but when is the possibility of federal and state funding of elections for counties going to come about? Well, I don't. I would hope that federal funding of elections would stay where it is, minimal. Um, in other words, if you really read the original Constitution, and that part has not been changed, is it's really this leg legislature of the of the states. So it's really a state responsibility. Now the federal does have federal laws, and we make sure, and we the judges will make sure that states comply with those federal laws. But really, states run the elections, and typically. As the states run elections, it's the counties in the states run their elections. Georgia, when we went to electronic voting in 2002, 2003, we said we're going to have a unified system. So all 159 counties have the same system. There's only one other state that does that. Typically, if you go to other states, go to Kentucky, go to Tennessee, different counties will use different systems. From a standpoint of training, we're glad it's a unified system. But the state bought those. Uh, bought the equipment in 2002, bought the equipment in 2019. So it's that way, it's there. But the county do run the elections. So county commission, we are so grateful when you make sure that your election <laughs> offices are all funded. So thank you, God bless you. You, know, you, know, so thank you. you don't know how important that is. And I know that your election director is very grateful for what you do for her. So thank you. We spend enough money already. <laughs> but it is really uh, county run. And that's why it's so important, the poll workers. Uh, are going to be people that you meet out here, you know, uh, whatever your local de department stores are, grocery stores, things like that. And it's the way it should be because that's how our founders designed it. Any other questions? I got one too. I'm also a commissioner. My question is to you. Our election supervisor comes to force, and due to the population, we've got to buy supposedly six more machines. But then your statement that we're voting less on voting day. Everybody's voting early, so why, which we opted not to buy, to spend that money for that? So why do I need, you know, another fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment that we're not going to be using? Because state law has one machine for so many uh, voters, and, uh, but uh, we really probably need to look at tweaking that law. That based on if you already so many percentage of the voters already voted, then how many left in all those precincts that could potentially show up on election day mm -hmm. to allow to do that? And that would be a great uh, thing for us to look at for future uh, legislative changes because we understand the issues that it is. But 